A shot zipped past his head, narrowly missing, leaving an indent on the wall mere inches away. He froze, peeking out from cover, scanning the area for any sign of the enemy. Nothing. Not a single movement. But still, he didn't feel the least bit safe. There was a more secure stronghold, a bunker only a short dash from where he was squatting. Gripping his weapon close to his chest, Private Mitchell took a deep breath, psyching himself up before rushing across the battlefield towards what he hoped would be better cover. Ducking under a camouflage tarp that covered the entrance, Mitchell was met with a sight of his squad mates, all sitting huddled in the foxhole, some looking dejected and miserable, others cowering in fear, all apart from Sergeant King, who sat cross-legged in one corner, wearing a permanently crazed, wide-eyed stare on his face. An exhausted Private Mitchell sat down with the others, unable to offer more insight than a nod of mutual condolence to his comrades. For a while, the members of MTF IOTA 17, the unit codenamed the Greendale Humans, found themselves feeling the simultaneous mix of frightened and bored. Each one of them could have achieved the same sense of anxiety by drinking 10 cups of black coffee, loudly knocking on their drill sergeant's door in the middle of the night, then rushing back to their barracks to hide under their bunks. Movement from outside caused the whole team's heads to swivel, peeking out of a gap in the outer wall of the bunker. They saw the enemy immediately, two of the ghostly incorporeal figures roaming the battlefield outside. Not to be underestimated despite the baggy, oversized tactical gear they wore, and weapons that looked too big for them, and two outside meant the other three were still out there somewhere. One gave a nod to the other, instructing him to scour the area surrounding the bunker. Mitchell was terrified, and all too aware that there were too many of them in the bunker. The enemy was bound to find them soon. All of a sudden, Sergeant King seemed to stir from his strange trance and produced a box of matches. He held out four in his hand, keeping them covered so that nobody could tell if they were picking a long one or a short one. The first of MTF IOTA 17, Private Davis, reached for a match as they were offered, his heart dropping as Sergeant King pointed it was a short one. Next, Private Byron picked out a match, a long one. Private Mitchell's pulse skyrocketed as Sergeant King offered him the remaining two, knowing that one would be long, the other short. He reached out and plucked a short one. King explained that the first short straw and the first long straw go. Bad luck, Byron and Davis, but I don't make the rules. Byron, not wanting to be at the mercy of the spirits, protested that those rules seemed made up. But Private Mitchell, even less eager to go out there, affirmed the sergeant's logic. Hanging their heads, both Private Byron and Private Davis gathered up their weapons and sluggishly walked out of the bunker. Moments later, still safe inside, Private Mitchell overheard the enemy taking fire, followed by the sound of splattering and yelps of pain from his two fallen squad mates. He offered a concerned look to Sergeant King, whose wide-eyed expression was doing little to ease Mitchell's nerves. They got our boys good. King muttered, rocking slightly, tagged them like the Bowery Wall. Still, lucky they didn't get hit by the cannonball. Mitchell asked in disbelief whether the enemy really had their hands on a cannon. No, no, the cannonball's just their name for it, the sergeant said solemnly. I've never seen it myself, but I heard rumors. Apparently these incorporeal delinquents sneak a steel ball in with their ammo. <laughs> That's their way of keeping things interesting. Who was it that said war is hell, or was it war makes people crazy? <laughs> crazy. I was crazy once. Mitchell sighed and asked why they don't just throw in the towel and surrender. You know darn well why. The mad commanding officer barked. Chaos, mass hysteria, a whole new mess for the Foundation to clean up. And you listen here. Maybe you can live with that, but not me. Not on my watch. The private asked to be let in on the battle plan, unsure if he was more scared of Sergeant King or the enemy outside. We should drag one of them in here, get him to give up enemy intel, King answered in a sinister, unhinged tone. He didn't respond well when told that the intangibility of the enemy may make holding one of them hostage, well, impossible. Still living in a fantasy, are you, Private? King chuckled maniacally and didn't stop for a full, unsettling minute. Look, I've had it up to here with the enemy and their dirty tactics. I say it's time we went full Return of the Jedi. We're the Ewoks and they're the Empire, now belt up and bear out! Grabbing his weapon, Sergeant King suddenly hopped to his feet and bellowed, letting out a primal scream up towards the heavens. Then he rushed out of the bunker, screaming his own name until a barrage of enemy fire opened up from all directions. Still cowering in the safety of the bunker, Private Mitchell sighed again as he looked at his commanding officer covered in splatters of paint. 
Fortunately for Mitchell and the rest of MTF IOTA 17, the injuries they had sustained in the line of duty were non-fatal, save for a few bruised egos and some stubborn paint stains on their uniforms that took a lot of seltzer water and lemon to wash out. The unfortunate downside, however, was that their defeat led to a localized anomalous event. The perpetrators of that incident? Five ghost-like entities with a bad habit of painting the town red. Literally. Meet SCP-2629, sometimes more commonly referred to as the 29-Year Paintball War. See if you can guess how it got that nickname. Located on the outskirts of Krakow, Poland, one can find an abandoned building that was previously used as an indoor paintballing venue. But now it's known to the SCP Foundation by its designation of SCP-2629. Inhabiting the location are a number of incorporeal entities, collectively known as SCP-2629-A. These are humanoid in their shape and behavior, but largely intangible. However, there are a few caveats to that which we'll circle back to. As for their appearance, despite being somewhat translucent, facial recognition software deployed by the Foundation has determined that these so-called ghosts bear a resemblance to a group of five teenagers, all of whom died during a driving accident. According to local police records, these deaths took place approximately five kilometers outside of Krakow, and there are no existing records that indicate the teenagers in question ever frequented the paintball venue, while they were alive anyway. Now, we mentioned not too long ago that these five entities aren't entirely incorporeal, or at least, they aren't 100% intangible. The exceptions here are the projectiles fired from their weapons. In this case, standard paintballs with no anomalous properties remain physically tangible. They interact with the world in the same way you would expect any normal paintball to, splattering on impact with solid matter, usually a hard surface or a human target. And this exception to intangibility also works the same way in reverse. Any paintballs fired at any of SCP-2629-A will have the same expected effect. Any and all attempts by the SCP Foundation to engage in direct communications with SCP-2629-A have resulted in failure. While they will often engage in banter and trash talk with their opposition during games, they seem to be uninterested in talking about anything other than paintball. During one attempt by Foundation researcher Dr. Ben Kazarinsiak to talk with the entities and ask why they spend eternity in a paintball arena, the only answer given by one of the anomalous ghosts, SCP-2629-A-2, was, why not? Every afternoon at exactly 1 o'clock Central European time, all members of SCP-2629-A will manifest within SCP-2629. Should they be left unattended, they will begin to roam freely, often gravitating towards the nearby neighborhood. This can lead to an event classified as an ALIF 2629 scenario. However, the occurrence of an ALIF scenario can be averted should the five entities be engaged in a game of paintball. It is the only known measure to deter them. And as such, the SCP Foundation has assigned Mobile Task Force IOTA-17 to deal with the problem. Every day, all members of MTF IOTA-17, the Greendale Humans, enter the paintball facility via an underground tunnel. Each of these operatives possesses a high level of proficiency in marksmanship, as well as close quarters combat utilizing firearms. On top of that, the Foundation insists that MTF troops in this unit also need to be great at paintball. The Foundation's MTF agents must engage the five members of SCP-2629-A in a game of paintball shortly after the entities manifest at 1 o'clock. The games follow the traditional capture the flag rules, wherein both teams have a flag that they need to protect, while also being tasked with securing the opposing team's flag. Should the Foundation's pro paintballers be successful in winning the match, then all instances of SCP-2629-A will demanifest peacefully until they return at the same time the following day. But should the five ghostly teammates prevail, or if MTF IOTA-17 breaks any of the conventional paintball rules, then this will trigger an ALIF-2629 scenario. But exactly how long has this protracted paintball war been going on for? Well, the clue is in the nickname. All the way back in 1988, the SCP Foundation received reports of unusual vandalism taking place in the area near Krakow. That might have been enough to pique their initial interest, but the sudden reported sightings of ghosts by local civilians was what really made them take interest. Descending on the small area outside of Krakow, the Foundation launched a full-scale investigation into SCP-2629. Given what we now know about the anomaly, it seems that with no one to challenge them, 
the five paintballing entities were free to enact an Aleph 2629 scenario unobstructed. Once the Foundation discovered the site of SCP-2629 and determined it to be the source of the local anomalous activity, they got to work evacuating the immediate vicinity of the abandoned paintball arena and devising containment procedures to keep unwitting civilians from getting caught in the crossfire of an imminent paint-slinging conflict. As far as the public would know, the abandoned SCP-2629 venue was shut down thanks to a hazardous amount of asbestos. Its entrances were sealed off to deter vandals and would-be urban explorers. But in reality, the Foundation was keeping people out so that the first match between their team, MTF IOTA-17, and the five members of SCP-2629-A could commence. The battle was relentless, paintballs flying in all directions, splattering any in their path. The Foundation lost a lot of good men that day, although they quickly found them again once they'd cleaned up all the paint. In an attempt to shift the tide of battle and turn the odds in the Foundation's favor, MTF operatives rearranged some of the indoor playing field. This, however, was an ill-advised strategic misstep, as messing with the venue's cover violated the established rules of paintball, and doing so caused an ALF 2629 scenario to begin. In response, a number of ALF 2629 procedures have been put in place to combat the anomalous event. Staff at Site-19 had to equip the protective paintballing gear stored at their workstations or in lockers around the facility. If any of them couldn't access their gear, the next best thing Foundation personnel could do was cover their eyes and ears until the event passed. Any and all delicate equipment had to be stored for safety purposes. Security staff are tasked with making sure any SCPs that might be vulnerable are kept out of harm's way. The Foundation currently has no way of barring SCP-2629-A's access to areas, thanks to their incorporeality. However, they can be deterred by being presented with an abundance of targets. Staff are to remain on high alert until the ALF-2629 scenario is over and the all-clear signal sounds. With all this preparation taking place at Site-19, no less, you'd expect an ALF-2629 scenario to entail something pretty catastrophic. It wasn't always such an issue. During the initial decade following SCP-2629's discovery, the ALIF scenario used to entail the five SCP-2629-A entities roaming the nearby area of Krakow and opening fire on people and property with their paintball guns. Hardly a paint-based war crime, but definitely goes an unnecessary extra mile in terms of vandalism. Then again, you try being stuck for an eternity in a paintball arena. Sometimes it's nice to stretch the invisible space where your legs used to be. And by now, you've probably made the connection, the unusual vandalism that drew the foundation to SCP-2629 in the first place was the ghostly teenage paintballers literally painting the town whenever they manifested, only to fade away after a few hours. But that's only what the Aleph scenario used to entail. It happened during the 12th consecutive year of the paintball war. A third MTF loss against SCP-2629-A caused yet another Aleph scenario to activate. But this time, instead of roaming the local neighborhood, the incorporeal teen's victory sent them to one of the Foundation's most highly guarded facilities, Site-19. Multiple unsuspecting Foundation research personnel were splattered with paint, the first of the Paintball Wars casualties to fall outside of a 250-meter radius from SCP-2629. The Foundation launched an inquiry into how these five incorporeal anomalies were able to breach the security of Site-19 citing loose lips among MTF IOTA-17 about Site-19. As such, they were banned from ever mentioning Foundation operations during their paintball skirmishes with SCP-2629-A. However, the lasting damage was already done, and unlike a paintball splatter, there was no wiping this away or covering it up. Every loss that MTF IOTA-17 incurred in the coming years would result in all five of SCP-2629-A manifesting within Site-19 celebrating their Capture the Flag victories by committing paintball retribution against Foundation personnel. Staff and corridors were splattered with paint, and attempts to return paintball fire were unsuccessful in dispersing the incorporeal attackers. One researcher even sustained an eye injury after being struck in the eye by a stray paintball. As the years rolled on, MTF IOTA-17's losses began to increase rapidly. More and more ALF-2629 scenarios were occurring each year, Foundation facilities abruptly and messily redecorated by a volley of paintballs. The Site-19 director issued a communique to the Ethics Committee, requesting the termination of SCP-2629. MTF IOTA-17 may have some of the best trained people in the world, but SCP-2629-A have been gaining experience for decades. It was only a matter of time before the skill gap closed. 
Anyone we recruit to fill a vacancy in NTF IOTA 17 is going to need to be able to counter nearly 30 years of paintball experience, and that number is always growing. All five of SCP-2629-A had already gotten tired of trashing their own neighborhood, and before long, they'd similarly get bored of trashing Site-19. The question was, once that happened, where would they hit next? Now check out SCP Chaos Insurgency Explained, and I survived 100 days infiltrating the Chaos Insurgency, here's what happened for more.